Here's an interesting puzzle for you to consider. I have a circuit here built up from an AT1085. The, on the right shows a schematic for this circuit. And you see that I have three LEDs connected to through three resistors to three output pins on the AT1085. I have a 10K pull-up resistor going high, and that connects to a, a push-button switch, which will pull to ground when I, pull, when I push the button. So I'm going to switch it on, and notice that LED up there shows that it's, that it's on. Notice that the LEDs do not light up, but I press the button once, the first LED lights up. As I continue to press it in sequence, it continues to count up. Now all I'm doing is forcing a reset on the ATtiny85. So how does it how is it able to do this? How is it able to remember the previous state and, and count up? Think about that for a minute. And then if you haven't figured it out, you can watch the rest of this video and I'll explain how it works. For this video, I'm going to be using a tool I started writing um, several years ago, I think back in 2014. I called it AT-Tiny10IDE. And it's actually my own version of sort of like a mini Arduino IDE system. Um, it's available on GitHub. I'll flash up the, uh, the URL right there. It contains all the source code. It's written in Java and it's designed to be compiled and run under IntelliJ. But if you click right here, you can download just a jar file that you should be able to execute on your machine so you don't need to do any, any code compilation. It's designed to run on, on Mac and Windows now and there's support for programming the, the very small ATtiny10 chips and quite recently I added support for, for working on the um, other chips in the ATtiny family such as the ATtiny10. This is sort of beta status as I'm warning here. I can't really give you a complete overview of my ATtiny10 IDE program, but let me give you a quick tour. Um, here I've opened up a file called blink85.c. It's the classic blink program for the Arduino. You notice there's an include arduino.h directive here, and um, that's noticed by my IDE, and if, if it's included in the code, it tells it to compile the project in a way that's compatible with the way you'd code for, for the Arduino, such as having a setup method and a, a loop method. Um, if you do not include this, this directive, then it assumes you're writing a regular C file and there's supposed to be a main method to call. And you won't have available any of the Arduino extensions for pin mode and digital write and so forth. You'll be essentially writing for the raw um, AVR um, library using AVR IO probably. I've also included um, special directives called pragmas that the IDE recognizes in the source code, and this this tells it, for example, what what, what type of chip you're compiling for. In this case, an AT Tidy 1085, and allows you to set values for the fuses and so forth. If I go up here and I set to build, it's going to build the program and generate a listing output over here and a hex output over here. But let's go back and instead open up the project that we're talking about here. The um, the reset demo using the reset pen as a way to do input. Here I'm going to compile this. It's also set up for ATtiny 1085, but I'm using AVR IO and I'm, therefore I'm, I'm talking directly to the at the microprocessor code level doing directives like DDRB and so forth. So I'm going to compile this and there's my output code and there's my hex output. It's a very small program. Now if I want to program this into the chip I simply connect my ISP programmer. I'm using an AVR ISP Mark II. It's an old programmer that the Atmel used to make, but there's there's modern equivalents to it. So here I just say program device, and it actually writes the code out using um, AVR dude. I can also, if I want to, under actions and ISP programmer, I can I can read the fuses, and it goes out and actually queries the device and shows me the current setting of the fuses. I want to change them, I can go up here and say program fuses. And uh, this presets it to the values that are defined by the pragmas in the code, but I can override these if I want to by, by clicking them on and off. And then I can, I can write the fuse settings out to the code. Uh, this is a write-up on the, on the project I'm going to talk about here. It's available on my, my website on, um, on Google Sites. 
uh, I'll, again I'll flash the URL up there um, the uh, the basics the basics of the trick is take advantage of a register in the AVR called the MCUSR status register contains a series of bits inside that indicate uh, when a, when the processor resets it tells you what caused the reset and in particular if the reset was caused by pulling pin 1 or the reset pin low it sets this bit here called EXTRF or external reset you can actually test for this when the processor begins execution uh, and use it to tell that the button was pressed as opposed to if the la if the lowest bit is set PORF that's the power on reset flag that means that the processor was powered up when it was it was reset when it was powered up and you can distinguish between these two different states when the processor begins execution the other trick you have to be aware of is we need to have a, a location in static RAM that isn't cleared each time the processor is reset actually the processor doesn't clear the static RAM instead there's there's code inserted by the compiler that it, just before it, it calls the the main method in your code it calls the clear memory function and normally wipes everything to zero. However, if you declare a variable such as I'm doing here, the variable count, in this rather funky syntax, what it does is it tells the compiler to exclude the RAM space used by this variable from, from being cleared at startup. So once we can do that, the trick is really pretty simple. As it comes to the main method, the first thing it does is it sets a DDRB equal to 7. That actually enables the three bits we're using as LED outputs to be outputs. We have to do this each time we start because all the I.O. registers, including the, the, the DDRB and the port register, are all clear each time the, the processor starts up. Then we, we check the MCU register, the MCUSR register, excuse me, and it will external reset. And if that bit is set, then we go into this particular routine here. Now, at, at the first time we power it up, we're going to actually take the else case. And all that does is it actually sets count to zero and then copies that value to port B, which is the output port. That actually sets all the LEDs to off. So the first time you press reset, we're going to come back around. This, this, this test is going to pass. We're going to actually call this code here to, to clear the, the, reset, the external reset flag bit. And then we're going to increment count. And we're going to assign it to port B. And that's going to count up. It set the LEDs to off, off, one, or, or the one state. Each, each successive time we, we press reset, it's going to go back to this loop around and around again, and then it's going to continue to, uh, to count up. If we power the processor off and power it on again, it's going to go through the else case, and it's going to set it back to zero. So you, you might ask, really, why should I care about this? What's, what's the point of this circuit? Well, so a couple of things you might consider. You can use it to implement test modes so that you can press the reset button to engage a mode that's not normally engaged at startup. Maybe you can use this to verify that all the LEDs on a display are working by, by flashing them sequentially or by flashing them on and off. You might use it for feature selection. That is, you might uh, combine it with the use of EEPROM so that once you make your selection, it, it persists even when you power up the next time. This gives you a way, for example, if you're writing a, um, so a program that flashed LEDs in different patterns, you could select the particular pattern it chose to flash at, at power up, like you're making, say, some, some custom Christmas tree-like controllers. Um, or if you combine with another available input, like this, say you have a, another, uh, another push button, you could get even more refined by uh, checking for that button being pressed at the same time you, re you release the reset button. Um, and only in, in that case would you save this state to EEPROM. And there's variations on this scheme. You might use it in a, in a, um, in a production setting to engage a, a, a one-time test mode for verification before the product goes out the door um, or other, other functions like that. Now you might ask, can this be used with the Arduino? And unfortunately, the Arduino bootloader uses the same trick with the reset pin to uh, distinguish between when it goes to upload code and when it's actually turning the processor on. So, while I haven't investigated this in detail, I think using it with, our, with a straight Arduino is a bit problematic. Uh, if you like this video, please subscribe. I'm trying to build up my subscriber base. I've got more videos coming. Um, please click the like button and, and let me know. If you have any other, other comments, please leave them down below. Um, some people asked about the little device that I used to power up the circuit in the beginning. 
Uh, that's something I'll talk about in an upcoming video. It's a little custom board I designed um, that uses a rechargeable uh, AAA cell, uh, a lithium ion cell, and it can generate uh, a 3.3 volts uh, or 5 volts. It's USB rechargeable um, and it just snaps directly into the, into the breadboard to control things.